Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Room. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on J- Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Today we welcome Sam Thornton, who is one of the founding members of Peloton, a recruiting company here in Japan. While it is known for the lifetime employment system, Japan is experiencing significant shifts in mindset and the perceived value of work. Major demographic changes, shortage of labor, and necessity to diversify the labor force all play a role in shaping the current situation and creating both challenges and opportunities for the future of work in Japan. Well, thanks for thanks for having me here today. I guess I'll give a quick um, self-intro before I kind of get into the weeds. Um, I am I'm from the US, um, you can probably tell by my accent, and I've been in Japan for over five years now. Um, not a super long time, but they're starting to add up. And uh, yeah, um, as Maya mentioned, I, I work in the recruitment sector. Um, I've been doing that for most of my time here. Um, and the primary business that I'm in is actually helping um, foreign businesses, especially tech companies, like software companies from the US, um, to, to make their way into the Japanese market. Um, and so that has, uh, it's led to a lot of conversations and learnings for me around what makes the Japanese market so different from other, other labor markets. Um, there's a lot of very specific issues that foreign companies have to deal with when they, they come here that they're just not used to. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, you know, it's possible to just kind of continue to try to run through, run through the brick wall over and over and over again. But, uh. I'm the kind of person who uh, um, I, I can't help myself. I'm just endlessly curious. So um, when I face these problems, I just want to know what's behind them. And so I found myself um, doing a lot of research about um, Japanese demographics and 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 what's happening um, with the labor market overall. And so um, yeah, so that that's kind of the background here. So I'll I'll preface what I what I have to say with um, you know I've only been doing this for a few years. I don't have like a PhD in this. Um, I'm very happy to have people tell me that I've like misinterpreted or I'm wrong about something, you know, I've studied a little bit of social science, but I'm not a social scientist. So, um, yeah, very happy to, uh, uh, have, have pushback or debate if people, uh, uh, think that I'm off on something. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so in terms of the topic, um, future of work, it's, uh, maybe a hot, it's kind of a hot, uh, you know, hashtaggy type phrase these days. Um. It's pretty broad. I think it can cover a lot of things. Um, And I'm going to start pretty high level today. Uh, I think if things, you know, if if there are topics that people are really interested in, we can dive in deeper. Um, But I'm going to really start from macro trends, like just like demographic shifts and sort of like uh, next like 10 to 20 years, like things that are sort of inevitable Um, and then work down into some things that are possible depending on what we do and what the institutions and the powers that be decide to do. Um, And then sort of talk about for each of those things, some of those things are challenges or problems. And some of those things are, are, you know, opportunities to get involved in uh, doing something new. So uh, yeah, I'm going to try to touch on, on all of those a little bit um, and we'll kind of see where we go. So to start off, um, I think the, there's basically two, it's kind of all one phenomenon. So you'll, I think one thing that you'll find as I, as I go through this is that all of these things are deeply related, you know? Um, and so I'll kind of be circling back because each of the challenges connects to the opportunities and the macro trends all kind of feed into each other. But um, I think there's a couple of well-known truths about the Japanese market um, and the Japanese population that won't come as a surprise to any of you who have, who have spent any amount of time learning about Japan. Um, First, the uh, the I'll, I'll start with the aging of the population, right? Um, I think many people know that Japan is it's the oldest uh, country in terms of median age, which I believe this year has now gone to forty eight. 
um, which means half of people in Japan are older than 48 years old. And I've got in front of me um, a chart, which you can't see, um, but it's uh, uh, something that I put together based on data from the, uh, uh, what's it called? The National Institute of Population and the Social Security Research, um, which I won't, I won't try to read the kanji right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Won't put you through that, and uh, yeah. So the the two largest age brackets, it's like um the shape of it is like it's this tail, and it starts low at the zero, and then it goes up, and it peaks at the forty five to forty nine range, and that's where most people. That's the largest um, eight, five year age cohort, and the second largest five year age cohort in Japan is the seventy to seventy four year old. So there's a little dip in the middle, and then it goes back up there, and so. These are the two most common age brackets for any person that you meet in Japan to fit into. Um, then if you look at the US, the the most populous age cohort in Japan, I mean, in the US is 25 to 29 years old. Right? So it's pretty, there's a whole generation there. Um, and the next biggest one in the States is interestingly um, parallel at 55 to 59. So there is essentially Japan's aging is a full generation ahead of the United States and the the birth rate in Japan is not showing any signs of of changing anytime soon and I think the 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 thing to think about when we're looking at these these age demographics is that even if tomorrow the government came out with some new policy that supports uh you know increased paternity leave and uh, supports mothers going back into the workforce after taking time off to, to raise their, their babies. Um, and suddenly all of the young Japanese people said like, let's go have a bunch of babies. Like, let's just do it. Now it's a great time to do it. It would still take over 20 years for that to have a, an impact on the size of the workforce <laughs> because it takes over 20 years to make an adult person, right? So that is a macro trend that is not going away there is not going to be suddenly more young people out of nowhere. And if there are, then they will be children, not adult working people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one macro trend that I want to point to um, just as like a, this is the next 20 years, this is reality, right? Um, so I'm going to put that there. And then I'm going to mention the other um, deeply related macro trend, which is the shrinking population. Um, and of course these things are related, right? If you don't have babies, uh, people aren't being born faster than the rate that they're dying, uh, then you're getting less and less people, right? Um, I wasn't a math major, you can tell, but I think that's, uh, I think that pans out. And so if you look at similarly, the same statistics bureau that I was talking about before, um, the population, I believe dropped, uh, it's less than 1%, but 0.7% in Japan last year. Um, and there's some projections here. Uh, let me try to pull out kind of so some of the more tangible ones here. Um, so the working age population, um, as of the 2015 census, had fallen to 77 million people from its peak at 87 million in 1995. So that means that in that 20 year period, there was 10 million less working people in Japan. Um, and so it's dropping each year. And it's projected to decline. Let's see if I can pull out a salient number here. Um, it's projected to decline to below 70 million by 2029, which is a further drop of 7 million people from where it was in 2015 and below 60 million by 2040. So obviously, you know, these things, these things um, could shift uh, depending on, right? Like if policy changes and, and people start having a lot of babies, but but I mean, again, like I said before, even if that happens, it will take over 20 years for these people to even enter the workforce, let alone to become like fully trained, experienced mid-career professionals, right? And so when I'm looking at this number that says that it will drop to below 50 million by 2056, um, there's actually a reasonable chance that that's almost inevitable. Um, and so maybe it won't go quite that low, but we're talking about currently 70, around 75 million people in the workforce. And so that means that it will go to two thirds of that within the next generational uh, period, basically. And so that's, that's a very, that's a very significant shift. And it's, it's, it's basically unprecedented in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, 
these are things that are really shaping what's happening, right? And so this is why I think globally people are talking about labor shortage, and there's a lot of reasons for that um, that are different depending on what sector you're in. Um, I see basically two different things happening at a, a sort of a macro level in the economy right now around the the labor shortage conversation that are very different, but both but both say labor shortage. And one of them is the, um, especially I've seen this more in the US, I haven't heard so much about it in Japan, but the people who work sort of repetitive, um, like menial, maybe menial is not the right word to use, but they work these kind of jobs that feel meaningless to them um, for low wages in, in poor conditions. And they have decided that they would rather just not work than work that job, right? And so we are seeing a lot of that in the States um, and they're calling it the great resignation. And there's all these people who are, are not wanting to work that way anymore, right? They've seen another way, they know it's possible and, and they're basically pushing for that, right? Um, I don't think that that's what's behind when people talk about the labor shortage in Japan. And what we're seeing, like my firm, we specialize in mid-career uh, professionals who are, 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 you know, they're maybe overpaid um, because the these U.S. software companies are really trying to um, grab the talent from each other. And so they're really throwing money at the market. And so th we're not seeing these people leaving their jobs en masse. You know, it's not, that's not where the, that's not where it's located really. So, so the talent shortage in that part of the, of the workforce is really talking about how there's not enough people who are trained and not enough people who are educated to do these sort of high skilled jobs. And so where we see it more on that side is with the, you know, the rise in demand for uh, data scientists and for people who can integrate these technologies and, and people who can lead these like digital transformation projects and these kinds of things, um, or people who can work on advanced pharmaceutical research, right? In the healthcare sector, um, there's there's a lot of demand for that right now, right? Um, just coming out of a pandemic. So that I think is more where we're seeing the labor shortage on that side. And that is especially, I think in Japan. So so I guess both of those are, are salient in Japan. Both of those are relevant to bring up, um, but I want to differentiate them because I think that the the challenges and opportunities actually look very different there, um, despite them both having the the appearance of a labor shortage. Um, how you, how you handle them, I think, is very different. So with that, I think that th those are basically the key kind of pillars that I, I want to outline so that we can kind of understand what's happening in the workforce. Um, and so to summarize. That means that Japan has the oldest workforce in the world. Um, it has the fastest shrinking workforce in the world, to my knowledge. Um, and that there is a, a shortage of skilled labor in certain sectors um, that, that it, it's all coming together to create this squeeze, right? Um, so, that's kind of the the overall direction that we're going and those are trends that are again you know I, I think not so much with the skills gap I think with the the aging and the shrinking population though those are those are like inevitable trends um, and I, I, I so I want to put those there and then I want to kind of move on to talk about what the sort of uh, what the changeable trends are or what the things that depend on what we do uh look like but before i go into that i'm going to pause for a second and uh, uh open up if, if there's any questions or if tam or maya if you have any comments that you want to add on that well thank you sam um yeah i i, I uh a lot of the things you said uh I, yeah i find really interesting um so you're talking about the aging trends okay and uh I, I'm one, I'm just curious, and by the way, disclaimer, I am in no way looking for a job, okay? I'm semi-retired, I'm, I'm a lone wolf, I'll never work for anyone again. But I do know people my age, again, I'm 63, or even people in their 50s, late 50s, who want to get a job. And I'm wondering if you've seen, you know, in, in light of the needs out there for talent, are you seeing this age discrimination happening um, or maybe maybe people my age don't have the IT skills to fill the positions that are in demand? Um, so that's, I guess that's my first 
what are your observations on that front? Do you think the the age discrimination thing might break down just out of pure need? And I guess I would say the same thing about females. You know, um, there's so much talent here among the females, but they get shut out. And you wonder at what point do they need people so bad that they're going to put away their their old ways of thinking toward women and let them be part of uh, the workforce? Ho hopefully those those questions made sense. Those are great questions, Tim. Thank you for bringing up both of those points. And I think that they they point to um, two of the um, sort of opportunities that I see. And so these will be themes that will, will come up repeatedly. Um, and one of them is um, reskilling or upskilling, and the other is diversity in the workforce. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, we are seeing, I, I still see, um, quite frankly, I see a lot of uh, age discrimination. I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's pervasive, I, I think. Um, and it's, it's kind of bizarre to me. I, I even see, you know, I, I'm not such an expert in this. I don't spend a lot of time sitting down with like large domestic companies, HR departments. So I, I don't fully understand the way that this works, but, you know, even in the, even in the Japanese firms, they have this, the Tainen, the, the decided age at which you must retire type system. And th th that persists to this day. Um, and there, there is this sort of unwillingness. I think a lot of there's still this strong perception that older people are, oh, you know, well, they might they might only work here for a couple more years, or like, oh, they don't have as much energy, or or I, I'm not sure what all exactly the the sort of excuses are, but it is still there, and it is something that I think you're right. I think it will have to change, and I think that it it can and should change there, and and especially Japan. I mean, I I think. Um, uh, not to get ahead of myself, but but these trends that we're seeing in Japan are coming to the developed world, world globally. Like it might take 20 years for them to get to where we are here, but like the almost every developed country is on the same track right now with the aging and and, and uh, the population trend. So this is it's coming. But I think Japan is a great example of a country where, like you said, the 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 older people are still they're full of vitality and they want to do work like they want to do things right um there was an article uh pretty recently that I, I was reading about uh 90 like some a man in his 90s who is working at the local mcdonald's somewhere in the countryside here um just because it, it keeps him occupied and he he likes to interact with the people and and he doesn't need to work there it's not like uh he's he's like like impoverished and needs to do that to survive it's like he he wants to do something and that's the opportunity that he has and so i think um it's something that i have pushed and that i i'm thinking that there's a big opportunity in the market around um when we see foreign companies come here for example they want to hire this like the profile that they have in mind is this like 35 year old like up and comer who, you know, is just going to go and just run through brick walls to get the job done. Um, and my advice to them is quite often, look, in Japan, I mean, if you want to get things done, it's probably better to have a senior person anyway, um, because, you know, they know people and they'd be more respected, right? So Gray that, hair helps a lot. Exactly, hair. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, you're right as well. I think that having more women in the workforce, um, it may well become a a necessary survival factor and it's it's kind of sad that um it has to come to that for for conditions to improve but i think that um hopefully it does spark some significant change there and so i will get into that in a, a bit more later um also about um sort of internationalization and whether that might be a factor in, in managing this but i do think that increased diversity in the workforce um and keeping people uh working longer and, and upskilling the people who uh, maybe just have a small gap from their experience to what's in demand now um, are all big opportunities that are coming up. Um, so I see that also you brought um, Erwinton up on stage. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Erwinton go if there's a question. Yeah, I have a question, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for having me here. As we know, uh, Japan's uh, population is shrinking right now. And as far as I'm concerned, your job is to bring technological companies around the world to Japan, Sam. For me personally, it seems a paradox, given the fact that most people in Japan are not digital native. It's very difficult for technological companies to expand their market compared to Indonesia, for example. In Indonesia, most people are young people. 
we are digital native. So it's much better if I were a, if I were an investor to invest my money in Indonesia compared to Japan. How do you think about that, Sam? I like that. It's a good conversation. Um, so that's that's a really interesting point. Um, and I think there's a lot of different. I think there's a lot of different things going on. A lot of differences between Japan and Indonesia that make it um, difficult to compare them directly. I think. I'll, I'll just give you at the high level why one of the things that I think a lot of com brings a lot of companies here is just the sheer size of the Japanese market. Um, it is still it's it's starting to it's starting to fall down the ranks maybe, but it is still the third largest country by GDP um, in the in in the world in terms of market size, and so there is quite a bit of capital moving through the Japanese market. And frankly, it's one of the last countries that people come to, despite that, like we usually see our clients have already expanded across Europe. They're usually in Singapore already. So, so to your point, I think usually they're investing in Singapore and the Southeast Asian region um, before they are investing in Japan often um, because it is, it's easier to crack. There's, there's higher levels of, of English usage and, and there are maybe there is maybe more flexibility around technological adoption, but in Japan for the companies that do succeed here, the market size is it's so large um that that the opportunity really just kind of it goes and goes and goes so you you don't see a ton of foreign brands actually really taking off here but if you look at um we had a conversation in in this room last week uh, um, with tim down in the audience brought up um, about ibm and ibm they have done very well for themselves here and and i think salesforce japan and microsoft japan just in my kind of tech zone um japan for many of them is their second largest uh, market in the world in terms of how much revenue they do here. So that I think kind of drives it. But I, I do agree in terms of if I was like a, if I was a venture capitalist investing in startups, I may be looking, I don't know. I think Japan's got, it's it's got something exciting kind of up and coming, but I think the Indonesian startup ecosystem is more established. I'm not really an expert in that, but that's kind of my instinct. Yes, it, it, it looks like uh, the opportunities that are available in Japan are not comparable to the opportunities in other countries, in Southeast uh, Asian countries. And uh, of course, Japan is, uh, some as you said, so the barrier of market entry here is really high. But because it is high, few companies actually enter the market, which gives them that prior, uh, well, opportunity to grow. And uh, as you say, the fewer the competitors, the well, the better the return. So it's really interesting uh, and it depends on how you look at the market and what you consider as uh, an opportunity. And um, well, basically I like this, that every challenge is actually an opportunity and the higher the barrier, uh, the better the return. So yeah, we do have here in Japan, there is a huge population of uh, non-digital native um, people, but this in itself is another well of opportunities for the tech companies and and well, of course uh, this as sam mentioned you know there is uh, opportunity for upskilling um and because we usually hear people say well the seniors you know or the aging people they are not um, digital native um, well it's a big problem but basically there are many of those people are willing to learn so the um continued uh, continued training Upskilling is uh, one of the great uh, opportunities here in Japan for people who are willing to learn. And uh, also, well, you know, services for people who are not digitally native is another way, you know, to look at, uh, at uh, the market. And I think that probably this includes the labor market too. But I may be mistaken, Sam. I, I, I just uh, would like to hear your opinion on this too. Yeah, well, th thanks for tying that back together. I, uh, I I do quite a bit in the kind of market entry space, and so I get a bit carried away with the uh, the economic factors. Um, I think the the yeah, it's exactly what you mentioned, and I I also want to tie in the point about um, whether people are digital or not in Japan, and why tech companies come here to another opportunity here, which is the opportunity of of automation, right? And so that it, it is, it's exactly what you said. You know, I think part of the None of the none of the opportunities that I'm going to identify today are going to just do themselves like they are all going to require a significant amount of effort and a, a, a coordination and, and people trying to make them happen. 
Um, but that's kind of what makes them opportunities for the for the motivated to capture. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. So building uh, services that that resonate for for Japanese people who are you know on on average they're they're older, um, and that that enable them in ways that they're comfortable with um, is it's a huge thing. I mean, if you look at for example, um, one of the favorite uh jokes of of foreign people who who are uh, following japanese life is the the hunko stamp the persistence of the ink on the the need to stamp all of the paperwork and that you know during the early days of the pandemic it was this crisis right where people were like well we can't work from home we need to be in the office so that we can stamp all the paperwork <laughs> and and people are just saying that's crazy and and anybody who lives here knows right if you're doing a rental agreement or or uh, you know an important contract like that, you need to bring your Honko stamp, and you got to stamp just over and over and over again, right? Yeah. Um, and it just never ends. Um, and and so we all laugh about this, like it's crazy, right? Um, but and then the fax machines thing as well, right? And it's all kind of related to this um, uh, information security and and these kind of you know to to an extent it's about familiar systems, but it's also I mean these are by some standards they're more reliable systems you can really count on them um and so we have like in in global i think almost anywhere else people are using um docusign or pandadoc or one of these kind of digital signature solutions right um but in japan there have been companies that are building basically they're you know i can't even i can't even begin to explain to you what the the technical difference between these is because i can't really imagine it but they're it's a digital honko okay and so they've created this way that for Japan, it's comfortable. And there is going to be a need to automate all of this office work. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a grind <laughs> to make it happen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, probably the, the right person to ask about how you convince the, the government to digitize um, all of these forms that you see when you go to the city office um, getting oh, passed around. But um, it is happening. Uh, it, it certainly is on the way. And uh, I think that that it's exactly these are these are the opportunities. Um, another one in automation that we're seeing that Japan is actually a leader in is is what you've also talked about in this room before, um, the robotics um, and the industrial automation. Um, Japan is really far ahead in that, and I, I think that that's going to, in terms of the the labor shortage and the you know manual labor um, and the people working, the the need for people to work in warehouses and factories and logistics and shipping. Um, those things, there's a big opportunity to automate them in Japan. Um, and it's just a matter of like, like that's an example of where Japan is almost more comfortable than other economies. Right. Um, and so interestingly, whereas in the States, we've kind of automated a lot of office work um, and desk work, um, Japan may be ahead in automating the, the manual work and maybe behind in automating the desk work. So um, these are things that as the population shrinks, right, you need to replace the people who are doing these tasks either with other people um, or with a process that does itself. So um, I don't know if that kind of answers what you what you wanted to bring up, Maya, but those are kind of my thoughts on that topic. Yes, indeed. Well, I'm not actually looking for answers, just for thoughts, uh, because it's uh, interesting to hear different perspectives. And uh, yes, I also um, have the question about women. Of course, you said that you were going to talk about it a little bit later, so maybe I should leave this question uh, to a later point today. But uh, yeah, it strikes me, you know, that um, as people say that, uh, well, you know, Japan is different in this sense or, or that sense. And by defining Japan as different, uh, a lot of people just stop there without trying to uh, actually identify the opportunities. And the other day I was talking with Tim Sullivan. Tim, you were, you were saying about, you were talking about... Uh, people with disabilities who were receiving um, care by, uh, well, remotely, actually. So that's another kind of automation, uh, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which helps uh, actually, uh, well, people get connected. So care for this can help people who need that care. But that's uh, probably, we can talk about it in a different room as well. So Sam, if you don't mind, shall we continue with what you have prepared for today? Yeah, yeah, I'll carry on. And I, I um, actually, why don't I, I'll go ahead and I'll outline the um, the kind of main um, uh, challenge opportunity pairs that I, I'm looking at. Um, and 
we can uh, we can kind of dive into them one by one. But I, I do think uh, maybe I'll, I'll start that with the um, um, what I'll kind of I'll kind of put in a, a, a broad uh, stroke as the diversity, okay. um, and I'll, then I'll break that apart into um, you know gender diversity and uh um you know i don't know what to call it um but you know i'll I'll call it like globalization or internationalization right the the diversity of of japanese and non-japanese people um i think there's other important forms of diversity to talk about i think that um diversity of ability is important diversity of background um so those are all kind of under there but i think there's a couple of kind of macro level things that um we see we see a big impact up there um so diversity is one that I'll kind of roughly group that. Um, another one is the um, lifetime employment system and the the mobility in the labor market. Um, I think is, you know, we we saw it was a couple of years ago now, um, but the the K Don then the the biggest um, uh, like business lobby here in Japan um, came out saying you know lifetime employment has to go. This isn't tenable anymore. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's, the businesses kind of decide themselves. I don't know if that. Um, I'd actually be interested to hear. Maybe um, uh, I know maybe Tim Tim down in the audience can help shed some light on whether that's really happening or not. But I, I, I have question marks about it. But it's 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 uh, the liquidity of the labor market. I think is overall an important thing to look at. Um, the the automation, which we talked about a little bit already, um, and also uh, yeah, remote. Remote staffing or remote delivery of services is another another thing that I wanted to touch on today because I think that that's um, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a hot topic, right? And I think there's some questions about how it will happen in Japan. Um, not all of which I can answer, but I can kind of point to some things that I'm seeing. And then last, which we've already talked about a bit, is the upskilling and reskilling, um, and the kind of like longer presence in the workforce of people. Um, and then, and that that also ch- ties in to some extent to mobility in the labor market. Um, I think that reskilling people is going to be a necessary thing that happens as certain jobs are automated. And then, what are these people going to do? Well, we need help over here. How can they help? Um, you have to. There's a gap there, right? So, um, so those are kind of the those are the overall categories that I would I would point to as as being um, uh, a key key to shaping what what happens in the next twenty years in terms of the world of work in Japan. Um, I will go ahead and jump into the diversity point and I'll start with the gender because I think that that's, that's what you brought up. And I think it's, it's the biggest, it's the most pressing one. Um, if you look at, you know, globally, like if you look at uh, historically, like the United States, right, we got a big lift economically when uh, women entered the workforce full time. Uh, it's, I mean, it's half of the population, right? it's a huge number. And so if you think about, um, I'll just roughly compare, but if you think about in Japan, 98% roughly of all of the people who live here on the island are Japanese, ethnic Japanese, native, local, um, however you want to phrase that. And only 2% of the population here is, is from elsewhere. Um, that's, you know, it's a pretty small number. Uh, and if you think about, okay, well, then you've got, what, what is it? Um, the other, you know, uh, 40, 49, 49% of the population then is Japanese women. Um, roughly, right? If you assume it's half of the Japanese people. And so that's a huge number of people um, that are largely, are largely getting not, you know, it's not that there's no working Japanese women, but they're, it's very difficult, right? Um, to, to continue, for example, if you want to have children, it's very difficult to continue your career here, right? Um, well, I do meet in my job sometimes women who have left the workforce for a couple of years um, because, you know, they have had a baby, right? And they wanted to raise their child. Very reasonable expectation, I think. And uh, uh, have it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to help these people to find work doing what they were doing before. Um, and I think that this is a mentality that, that will have to change as well as... Um, you know, just the, the lack, obviously, of, of gender diversity and executive positions. And, and these things are related. Uh, I think the way that hiring and promotion decisions are made, it comes from the top. And when the top is all one kind of person, they will, you know, obviously favor themselves. And that's that's men in this case. So um, I'll, I'll pause there for a second. I see that Candy has come on stage. So maybe there's a question as well. 
Yes. Uh, well, as a woman, I can say that I have seen um, the, the, the better part of, uh, you know, being a woman in a Japanese organization because, um, well, uh, the company which I work for, uh, they actually allowed me uh, to have a one year uh, maternity leave and there was no problem for me going back. But I, I understand that I'm rather uh, an exception than the rule. So, and uh, it looks like uh, a lot of, well, I have friends who had to quit uh, their positions because, uh, of course, you know, uh, there was that perception in, um, in the company that uh, by taking a maternity leave, they would, dis uh, well, inconvenience the people around them. So that's, uh, well, more of a cultural, uh, let's say, prejudice or cultural bias rather than uh, legislative bias, I think. But yes, uh, unfortunately, m many of the companies here do still have that, uh, that bias, which makes it even more difficult for women to stay even after, or, or, well, to stay and take their maternity leaves there and then go back to work. But let's say, Cindy, hello, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi, good morning, everybody. Ohayou gozaimasu. Hey, hello, good morning, good morning. Well, Being a woman in the for I mean the workforce just like uh, Maya here, I've been looking around and I've been here in Japan since 16 years old. And uh, I look I saw everything which is quite tough. And uh, 10 years ago everything changed a lot. And many women who are married right now has the chance you know, to keep the job, even they have kids. There's a lot of, you know, uh, care center here, nurseries for women, also for men who are working. If both parents are working and uh, you don't have any, uh, uh, the baby is not going to be cared of. There's a lot of institutions. You, you can have, uh, I mean, a leave. It depends on the company of, or, or, the pro of, of of what job you are in it totally depends but basically 10 percent of the company here has right now a leave for paternal parents and me as a woman having pro i mean working in the men's community i think i don't have any problem at all but a lot of people right now are jumping to the fields of the men's field from my perspective that's good but for others it's a competition already Yes, and once again, I think that, uh, well, as you said, uh, let's say, okay, I didn't know the number, but, or the percentage, so 10% of the companies here have, uh, well, they allow their uh, male employees to take paternity leaves, but um, I think that it's one thing to have this black and white, you know, written somewhere, uh, and then uh, you can tell, you know, your employees, you can take that paternity leave, but it's also another thing to actually take that, because a lot of men, they don't feel comfortable doing that because for well, of the same reasons I mentioned earlier, they think that it will uh, inconvenience uh, their colleagues, their co-workers there, or it would uh, even, you know, um, uh, let me say, uh, slow down their career growth because it happens to. Yeah, they get hurt their reputation. Their reputation well, as well, yeah. You know, Japan is a men's dominant world, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, right? <laughs> Women just came into the workforce around 10 to 15 years ago. True. So it was a big blast or it was a big shame for men that women right now is in the working force and they're trying their best to stay even though they are married and pregnant with their babies. Yes. So for, even for the royalties, you can see everybody's women right now you can see <laughs> right, right, yeah. right but, that's but they not don't my have choice we have to be uh, honest you know and, and say exactly that. It's exactly not my choice there exactly you can see by the royals they have women but mm. they don't see them as royals it's either it's men who will be royals and that's why everybody here in japan women are saying we should have equality regardless of everything and it was just out 10 years ago and it was too late <laughs> everybody's doing that by the whole world and japan is always behind this we are be always ahead of technology and new things but when it, when it comes to other things we're, we're 10 years or 15 years behind of all these things we have to catch up in a lot of ways that's what i'm going to say 
Oh, yes, I cannot agree more with you, but at the same time, we have to appreciate the fact that cultures and mindsets uh, take a long, long time to change. So, and uh, this is, I have sure. a question in this, um, in this context, I have a question to Sam. Sam, if you have, uh, well, some information about it, uh, I would appreciate it. But uh, I, I have heard that, uh, you know, you measure the labor market uh, by the number of people who are actively looking for a job. And uh, I just wonder, you, you said, you know, we've got 48% of uh, the Japanese, uh, native Japanese here, 48% roughly are women. But I wonder how many of them are actively looking for a job at the moment, because we're we are talking about, you know, women, diversity in the workforce, that it has to change, diversity has to increase, and so on and so on. But at the same time, if we don't have a large number or a large percentage of the uh, female population here looking for a job, then I cannot see that happening, right? So it's just, I wonder what the situation if, uh, is at the moment. Yeah, um, well, I'll try to comment on that a little bit, um, and and thank you guys for kind of leading the conversation on that on that last point. I think, um, yeah, these things are all deeply related. I think um, the you know I I don't know if there is data that breaks out um, uh, like unemployment rate by um, gender. Uh, maybe there is, and I just haven't seen it. But um, you know, I can say that in general, um, Japan is overemployed. So there, you know, there's, I see numbers kind of a range, but um, there's definitely, there's definitely no less than two jobs available for each Japanese person at the moment. And I, I see the number range more like five to 10. Sometimes even people say like 10 to one, as many jobs as there are to people who are actually even available to work a job um, in, in the market. So we definitely see that in recruiting. I mean, when when we're trying to when when somebody decides that they are going to change their job, they have many options available to them. Um, you know, they're always looking at at least four or five job offers at the same time. So it's you know the the ratio of jobs to be done to people to do them is again right. The workforce is not as large as the 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 demand in the economy. So. You know, in general, that's true. And I have a feeling that, yeah, like you said, I, I have a feeling that the the demand, the number of women looking for a job, well, I mean, it's like like Candy mentioned that maybe there hasn't been a long history of, of women in the workforce. So just to, like statistically speaking, there's going to be less of them um, looking for a job. Now, I, I think uh, my expectation, um, unscientific uh, instinct, is that, you know, in the younger generation, there's going to, we're seeing more and more uh, young women coming out of college, ready to to go into the workforce and saying, you know, I'm going to have a career, right? And and not saying, you know, oh, I'm going to, I would expect that the trend is more towards doing that rather than, um, you know, I'm just going to become a housewife, um, which I would expect will kind of change, uh, will change the, the, the number of, of women looking for work, right? So um, I do think one thing that I think uh, ties into this is um, maybe surprisingly, but the the lifetime employment system and the the liquidity of the Japanese labor market. Um, I think that part of the issue is that when you only work for one company for your whole career, what happens to you in that ecosystem decides your entire life track, right? Yeah. And so if you work for a company that doesn't have uh, great conditions for parents. Um, and like Candy brought up earlier, that includes fathers and support systems um, so that, you know, th mom and dad can both be at work um, and their kids can be taken care of. Uh, if you if you work in a company that do it doesn't have great support on that, well, you know, con contrary to what I just said about how there's a lot of demand for, for Japanese employees, there's also, it's quite tough if you are working in a there's not a ton of mid-career job opportunities at the the kind of prestigious, large, prestigious um, Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the sort of the large Keidetsu, like the, the Hitachis and the Fujitsus and the, the Toyotas and things, they tend to hire, do all of their hiring at a new grad level, and then they keep everyone through their whole career. And so they actually, many of these companies don't post job opportunities um, for mid-career jobs anywhere um, publicly. Uh, many of them don't um, even really have the infrastructure internally to to hire and to train these people to come in at a, at a mid-career level. 
And so that, that basically means that if you are in an environment where you're not being treated well, or if you, for example, are in an environment where you did take a maternity leave and that kind of is reflecting on your career um, in a negative light, then you don't have necessarily the option of just saying, okay, well, you know, forget you then, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna work for, for the competitor. And so you don't get a huge amount of competition on benefits um, and on, on flexibility. And I think that that does affect the, the trajectory of a uh, career for, you know, for, for women as well. Right. And it, it affects these, the pace of the culture shift, right. If there's more competition. And so that's kind of one reason that I'm, I'm fairly passionate about what I do uh, of bringing foreign companies here. Um, because I, I think one of the biggest benefits that it brings is the, the foreign working culture, certain things about it, that it it's creates additional competition in terms of the way that HR is managed. And so if people are looking at the way that other companies are managing their HR and saying, well, I prefer that, I'm gonna go work there, then it, it forces it forces the other companies in the market to ad adapt to that, right? So that's, um, yeah, I'll pause there. Uh, I mean, Maya ha wants the numbers, I have the numbers. As, as September 2021, the un unemployment rate is 2.8 M by the numbers. And uh, the jobs of application right now is 6.23 to 6.23 million by this year only. Mm. Thank you. That's interesting. So we said 2.8 million? Yes, 2.8 million, which is unemployed, men and women, both. Okay. Mm. Right. Mm. I think it's because of the corona shock. That, that's why this number is high. Probably, yeah. But they still, uh, well, the official numbers published by the government say that uh, there, is, there hasn't been a shock to the system, basically. There hasn't been an increase in uh, unemployment here in Japan. Which yeah, they will never say it, but the numbers are out already, but they will never say it. Yes. Well, what I've got here in front of me, I see it's 2.8%, which wouldn't actually be quite 2.8 million people, um, but it would still be between one and two somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, but if you think about there's 125 million people here, um, it's still actually pretty low. Um, I mean, in the United States, we just a few years ago, it was like almost like nine, 10 percent. So um, it's it's still Japan is is it's always one of the lowest in the world in terms of unemployment rate. Um, and I don't think that that's again, I think the squeeze is is there. Um, I, I do. I would I would agree there is most likely, especially among small business. Um, there's been a lot of businesses that have closed. Right. We've all seen that. So, um, yeah, I was, was going to say. You know, in those numbers are the sole proprietors or the mom and pop stores who who maybe went out of business. Are they reflected in those numbers or are they just collateral damage that's not recognized in the stats? Yeah, I mean, how you how you calculate unemployment is always questionable and how yeah, you calculate right. the, the amount of jobs that are available in the market. There's no just like central jobs database, right? So right. it's all right. interpretive. Sure. Sorry, Maya, go ahead. Oh, no, I, yes, I just wanted to, to say the same thing as you uh, to Tim's comment. And also, I, I wanted to continue uh, and say that, so obviously uh, you believe, and well, I, I also agree on that, that uh, bringing foreign companies here and uh, foreign working culture is one of the ways to solve um, the problems which, uh, well, let's say women probably say that we can increase the liquidity of the labor market. So uh, this is one of the, the, the solutions, but it also, it requires a lot of work, as you said, because there are some, um, let's say, difficulties. You, you actually need to educate those companies that enter Japan, that uh, uh, the culture here, the expectations of the labor force here uh, are different. So do you see that as, a, let's say, a high barrier to enter the market or is it something which is not that difficult to overcome? Yeah, so let me say, first of all, I don't think that um, foreign companies are necessarily better um, or worse in the way that they manage their human resources. Um, I think they're different and there are some places in which they're better. 
Um, and there are some places in which you could say uh, worse, depending on your perspective. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, like, for example, there's I was doing some research on this recently and I came across the term Gaishike Jigoku, which means foreign company hell. <laughs> and it's it's the, the phenomenon of people who leave the Japanese work environment to join a foreign company. And for them, it's just torture. It's the worst. Um, and a lot of people talk about the the dry work culture in Western companies. Like it's just this very business kind of transactional relationship with your with your coworkers. That's just about, you know, hey, did you do the thing? Where's the report? You know, get that on my desk. Whereas the Japanese business tends to be a bit more like the, you know, everybody's a family and, you know, your your manager is asking about your kids and, you know, it's a little bit more personal. You're going out for drinks with your boss after work and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I don't I don't really, you know, I think that there's there's differences, right? But I think that the important point is that um, if you have more differences, if you have more diversity of of um, ideas and of, of processes and of ways of doing things, then it it creates a competition, right? A competition of ideas and a competition of management um, styles that you know should push evolution, right? Should push forward movement. So that's that's what I look at, and that's why I bring that point up. Now, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, I lost the thread on you asked. Oh, about is it difficult to come here? Absolutely, I, I think. Uh, there's a huge barrier. And, and so this, uh, to tie this into one of the other points, um, is, is internationalization in Japan is, a uh, um, Kokusaika, I think they call it right. Is the, um, it's, it's, it's a common thing to, it, there's a lot of hype around it, but it's really hasn't manifested, uh, I think at the rate that people thought that it would. And, and in fact, we hear now about decreasing numbers of, Japanese university students being interested to study abroad, for example, or go to foreign universities. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the biggest barriers um, is, is the number of people who speak English here, right? Um, right. It's nowhere, it's not comparable to um, other major, major Asian hubs, um, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, of course, um, and Shanghai. I mean, I think there's just not, it's not that, uh, of course, China, I think there's a lot, a lot of people who don't speak English, but there's, uh, in Japan, just the uptake has been very slow considering the um, apparent effort to, <laughs> to, to teach everyone. It hasn't really stuck. So if you, I mean, there's no good, I haven't ever found good stats on this. If somebody knows like a source of really good stats on how many English speakers there are here, I'd love to see that. But I always, what I see the range is somewhere between you know, maybe it depends on how you quantify ability to speak, but somewhere between two to 8%, definitely less than 10% of people here speak English at a level that, you know, it could be considered like business conversational. Um, and so it makes it very hard when you consider that you're dealing with already just 10% of the workforce, which is already just a percent of the population. And then uh, which of those people actually have the skills and experience that you need um, to, to head up your Japan operation. Uh, you're, you're talking about a very small pool of people, right? And so getting started here is hard. And I, um, not to just plow through, but I think that the English, the ability to speak English and the internationalization thing also plays closely into um, the ability of Japanese companies to leverage foreign resources, um, both in terms of hiring uh, non-Japanese people to work in their domestic operations here in Japan and to manage those people, um, and also in their ability to leverage um, overseas resources, uh, for example, to employ uh, remote workers, um, to establish offices in, in foreign companies that could, for example, support on R&D um, of, of, for example, technical things where Japan doesn't really have the uh, upper hand, like in, in data science and some of what uh, Erwin Tin was bringing up about the, the opportunity in Indonesia, for example. Um, Japan has kind of struggled to, to leverage those opportunities to handle its problems um, as well, uh, its, its workforce problems because of the, uh, uh, I think a lot of it's just about communication and, and the language barrier. So I think that's a huge factor. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, I, I just want to, I, I think the language is, is, is a really important point, but I'm also glad that you touched on the intangibles, uh, the intangible cultural realities that would lead to, you know, a guy stage you go um, because I think it's really important and it shows the power of culture that it's not just pay, you know, there's more to it, but in the end, 
um, it shows the power of culture. But I also think the bottom line is, as, as you said, Sam, competition and diversity, you know, not saying one way is better than the other, but introducing competition never hurts anything. So um, I think that's a positive. Indeed, that is a very important point. Thank you, Tim. Sam, I thank you very much for uh, coming and being our uh, speaker today. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.